what the public sees online, because this is what the people are seeing that you you haven't really uh, taken a look at, perhaps. Um, I do. I do frequently. I look at PETA's websites. I look at HSUS. I also look at the website WALA. WALA is the Area Nation's website, and they support cockfighting. So to identify my extremes, I want to see both sides and know where we stand and who I'm going to run into on a daily basis. So this is from PETA's website. Um, some of you have probably seen this uh, uh, to uh, prevent Kentucky Fried Cruelty. And my personal favorite, you know, this uh, individual, this actress, um, she goes around with one of those shirts that has right across the front, please prevent Kentucky Fried Cruelty. Well, I hate to say it, me dressing my chicken outfit, I don't quite have the same attributes. I don't have <laughs> quite the same effect when I walk around, which is why I have to have a chicken. I mean, you know, there's, there's props that we all have to use. And certainly this is what we're fighting. Um, it is very hard to fight this kind of thing. And some of the pictures, look at this terrible, poor broiler chicken with half of its rear end missing. Well, I think that, from my interpretation, is a pretty good uh, um, proponent for uh, uh, beak trimming, but then that's not a popular sort of thing. Um, and again, this is one that supposedly is on the line that is still alive, that hasn't, uh, um, that is going down the line after, uh, uh, after being quote-unquote killed, um, not specifically after being hung. More evidence <laughs> of, of uh, damage to the feathers. So that's kind of uh, the things that people are actually seeing. And that's the only thing they're seeing online. They're not really seeing much of anything else. Um, it's, if you put in the words um, chicken welfare, 99% of what you put in, what you get back are the animal rights, um, HSUS, PETA, um, uh, Fun for Animals, ALF, uh, you name it, they're out there. And that's what the public is getting back. My own daughter, who is a public with a uh, degree in public relations, she decided that she was going to look at animal welfare as one of her school projects, and she called me up. She said, Mother, did you see the PETA website? My God. She says, I think I'm almost going to believe in animal rights. She, and she says, knowing the background, she says, it's amazing. And that's pretty much true. Um, so I'm going to start out with molt. Force bolting issues that the public is being fed is a removal of feet, removal of water, mortality, and that it's not natural. So the first one I'll address right now, or the first two, we do not remove water. And we haven't for quite some time. Um, uh, everybody recognizes it's not an issue. Removal of feed, um, because these animals are taken and they're put into basically darkness, um, I like to akin it to hibernation um, rather than uh, uh, specifically forced molt. That's kind of a hard term. Um, but most of the time these animals don't need to, the, they're not inclined to be doing a lot of eating. But we are now feeding um, a molt mash. Um, it's a low energy feed, and, and that was mentioned in the previous speaker about doing this to help reduce some of the, the gut changes that we see. Keep the birds, if they are um, awake and moving about, um, to keep them being able to have something to consume. And, uh, and I, uh, when I was talking about uh, um, molting, I used to say, well, my gosh, you know, that we, what we molt to is 20% of the body weight, or we molt to our mortality, whichever comes first, and then we stop um, the, uh, the removal of nutritious feed, and we start lighting those birds again, and we start uh, um, feeding those birds a more nutritious feed. Now, um, I attended Weight Watchers a while back, and I got a little plaque for uh, reaching 15% of my body weight loss. I mean, it was a big celebrated deal and 20% of body weight for the chickens, we get nailed pretty well for uh, uh, bringing it to that extent. Um, what is the reason why we molt? And the main reason is we've got to feed these chickens appropriate to their degree of what they're doing. So if we come in and we start feeding a heavily calcium-laden feed to chickens that are not laying eggs, we get urolithiasis and those chickens are going to die. And if we don't feed heavy calcium-laden <coughs> chickens who are laying, then we um, get cage layer fatigue, or um, basically milk favor, and these uh, chickens die of broken backs, broken legs, etc. Where do I see most of my cage layer, quote-unquote, fatigue? Um, my broken legs, it's in backyard flocks. 
because nobody knows when they're going to go and delay. So they kind of just throw some scratch out there, and scratch is kind of like candy. And so they don't really know um, how to appropriately feed these birds. And just like women with osteoporosis, the most critical time for feeding the calcium is in that two weeks prior to lay. So if we know when they're going to go and delay, and when they're not going to go and delay, uh, when are we going to stop laying, um, then we can appropriately feed. And the other thing I like to call is I like to call this recycling chickens. If we don't molt, then we have to use two or three times the number of chickens to produce the same number of eggs. <laughs> not only do we have to use more chickens um, before the actual females laying, but 50% of our flock is killed at hatch. Those are the males. And so that's twice as or three times as many males as we have to euthanize. Go figure. If you're an animal rights group, why is it that you want to ban molting? I would think that you would want to recycle these chickens so that you have less death loss. And this is our best way of keeping them going. I tried when I was at UC Davis. I had a um, Pacific Egg and Poultry Association grant. Very excited to look at chemical ways or some other way to initiate molt. And I went and I got an arimidase inhibitor. Now the University of California um, could not make an agreement with the company that produced this arimidase inhibitor, and that is that it inhibits estrogen. It's given to women to, um, uh, to make them less likely to come down with uh, breast tumors that are estrogen sensitive. And because we couldn't come to an agreement, I had to buy it over the counter. It cost me $5,000 and to medicate 40 chickens. But I was willing to go for this because it made sense. We got chickens donated to us that were almost to the end of their late period. We were going to give these chickens the arimidase inhibitor and hopefully put them into a molt um, without having to go through removal of feed or reduction of energy feed. Well, I can tell you that I spent my $5,000. I put all this stuff into the chickens, and they laid better. And they continued to lay beyond their normal lay cycle, and I went, okay. And I would not re recommend this method for increasing lay because it's rather expensive. Um, but we are out there looking for re ways to prevent <coughs> And not natural. Well, you know, I've seen a lot of natural molt. Our forced molting is about six weeks. Natural molt, sometimes you go completely naked for months. And if you've gone to look at some of the unusual and bizarre, which people said, since I'm unusual and bizarre, people send me this stuff all the time. Um, I got a, a, a forward of a site about um, a ladies' association in Great Britain that is knitting jumpers for naked chickens. And the jumpers have to be tight enough so the chickens do not get their little toenails caught in the jumpers. They're buttoned on the side, and you have to have appropriate size buttons so if they peck off a button, they don't choke on the button. So they have to be above the age three mentality for children, the, the toy. Um, so, or I should say for below the age three because they're kind of falling in that category. And the jumpers have to be color coordinated, the chickens, because we wouldn't want them to feel embarrassed about the fact that their colored feathers are missing. So these are kind of some of the things we're, we're counteracting. And, uh, and certainly I, for individual chickens, that's probably a good idea. So molt, this is a molted chicken or a, a chicken that is going through molt. Um, and molt, they lose feathers in a specific pattern. They gain them back in a specific <laughs> pattern. Um, and then they can start into laying it uh, again. What happens when I don't see birds molted appropriately um, or fed appropriately? Well, if this is a backyard chicken. This is one of the ones that I have to, this is kind of a makeshift necropsy table. Um, you'd uh, be surprised at the places that I have to do uh, post-mortem examinations. Um, and this is in a person's backyard, and this is fairly recent. And what you see here, oops, I'm sorry, that's a, that's a middle one here, is a stock egg. And that stock egg was um, because of the fact that this bird was not being fed appropriately. It had gone into lay too soon kind of precocious lay. The people hadn't known that you could use lighting to either prevent or stimulate lay. Um, and this is a backyard chicken that was running around. She was less than a year old, and she uh, died from this uh, um, infected and impacted egg um, that she had. So, so these are some of the things that we see. In commercial industry, we have everything timed, so this is fairly uncommon in commercial industry, but pretty common in the backyard type flock. Beak trimming. Beak trimming is the only emergency that I think of um, other than 
it, something like Newcastle or avian influenza. Um, I got my first emergency call about three months after I started at Purdue. Um, it was for Roland the Duck. Roland the Duck had been attacked by the family dog. It was at 10.30 on a Friday night. It's been a long time since I'd had a call on a Friday night for an individual animal. Um, and I said, yes, I would come out and take a look at Roland. Roland was still alive. The person was hysterical. And I tried to ask if there had been any penetration um, into, of the dog's mouth into the bird. Um, and she was too hysterical to tell me. So one of the conveniences uh, compared to California of Indiana is that there are 24-hour Myers and 24-hour Walmarts. I stopped at the 24-hour Meyer, and for $6.50, I bought myself a bottle of pruning sealer, kind of tar. And this is the veterinarian, poultry veterinarian's sure, quick um, cure-all, kind of like uh, uh, that movie uh, um, where it was uh, Windex that cured everything. Yeah. My husband's cure is uh, anytime anybody's sick in the family, it's a cold wash, wash rag and Mountain Dew. And it doesn't matter if you've got a broken leg or if you've got a sore throat or if you've got a stomach ache, a cold wash rag in Mountain Dew is what it, it helps everything. So this is what every poultry veterinarian should carry for uh, um, cannibalism or attack issues. And I went out and I looked at Roland, and the dog had dragged him. So he was missing all his feathers, and he had kind of rug burn, but there was no penetration. So you spray on this pruning sealer. It does a number of things. It is non-toxic to the bird if they go and try to peck at it. If you have a group of birds together, it's black, and birds generally don't like to peck at black instead of the red, oozy sort of thing that they love to peck at. If you're a chicken, somebody bleeding is the highlight of your day. It <laughs> makes a feast for everybody to go after. And I mean, this is just, I mean, about the only thing that's better is a pile of feces. That is even more exciting than blood. Um, so if you're a chicken, that is a highlight. And they will eat each other out in less than 45 minutes. And so if I don't have penetration of the abdominal cavity, or um, of, the, of course it's one whole cavity, or the thorax, um, then I go ahead and I use this. I can put it on three quarters of the skin can be missing. I can still save that bird. And where they die is from the dehydration. And if I put this on the outside, it's like a second skin. So my client was quite impressed. She says, this brings a whole new meaning to tar and feathering, which is kind of true. Um, so there is a very good reason why we bee trim, because it prevents this kind of activity. Now, the broilers are kind of the stoner birds of the bird world, commercial bird world. They're kind of bred out of being really obnoxious, so they kind of just chill. But the layers, uh, they're kind of the uh, real wild and crazies of the, of the commercial, broiling, broiler, or commercial bird industry. And so we do beak trim. Um, less tendency to beak trim in the uh, broilers. And so only needed because of factory farming methods? Uh-uh. Most of what I see is this right here. This is, a, again, a backyard. All these I'm going to show you are uh, backyard birds. And somebody got a little excited about the other one's vent. Now, this is what we call vent pecking. This right here is a vent blowout. Um, when I used to go to faculty meetings, I used to categorize them. A kind of gnarly faculty meeting was a vent pecking. A really, really nasty faculty meeting was a vent blowout. And I would tell my husband that that's kind of what occurred uh, in these uh, meetings. And it's very, very common. What happens when a hen lays an egg is that vent prolapses naturally. It keeps the egg clean. And when the egg is laid, that vent comes back in. For all of you who are used to animals with multiple orifices, chickens have only one. You know, everything comes out of that one hole. So you want to keep all that manure and everything else from getting on the egg. Well, sometimes, in some chickens, that vent doesn't go back in very fast. And boy, that's exciting, because everybody else is going to look and go, this is new. It's red. It's moist. Let's go for it, guys. And that's what happens. So this is a backyard chicken. And this was in about a half an hour period of time. So we're going to get to caging, which is the big issue. Ohio, we heard from. Um, it's, uh, of course, uh, Indiana is number three in table egg production. Uh, in California, um, that was a, a huge issue. Crowding, the abnormal social behaviors, physically confining not enough room to preen. Well, everybody talks about pecking order, OK? And that's where, where did it come from? Chickens. Chickens are naturally aggressive animals. The jungle fowl. One of the problems that I had 
when I was teaching is I really want students to learn about chickens. And you have to be a salesperson to do this because, I mean, veterinary students don't want to learn about chickens. They want dogs and cats. I mean, they will even take horses and cows and pigs. Chickens, it's like, oh, my God, you've got to be kidding. So i got to get out there. I bribe them. I give them candy in every class. I'm not their mother. If they get hyper, it doesn't matter. Um, I, I, I try to do anything to get them in to listen. And, and so this is uh, one of the things that I try to talk to them about is uh, with the cage situation. This is what I would consider a very good cage facility. And its management is excellent. These chickens that you see up here are looking, they're looking very, very clean. Um, you can see no pass through of litter. Um, you can see nice white feathers. They're all kind of looking at me when I go through. This is um, an important uh, uh, factor. Um, this shows a little bit of the eggs coming out. They're, um, the eggs is a proper collection of eggs. You don't have them running into each other. You don't have a lot of feces on the top of those eggs. And, you know, these are chickens in a cage. Well, when I'm a chicken in a cage, the most other chickens I might have to interact with would be, let's say, seven chickens. Well, as soon as I'm put in that cage, the pecking order is established. You know, there's going to be jostling and pecking and everything else like this, and then all of a sudden, somebody's on top and somebody's on the bottom, and the rest are in the middle, and everybody knows that. And that'll last for the two or so many years that they're in this cage. Well, if I'm a chicken and I'm put in a cage-free house, and it's 150,000 chickens, I've got 149,999 other chickens. The pecking order's never established. I'm always running into somebody new who wants to challenge my position, whatever that is. And so the fighting is continuous, and it is over and over. When I brought these students out the first time, and I was really excited, and I was in one barn, and was at our University of California campus, and I was in trying to show them how to take blood, that's a real issue. And I'd sent the really skilled students on to go to the next barn, and I said, don't open up the cages of the jungle fowl. Well, I didn't tell them what the jungle fowl looked like. They're little birds with big eyes and <laughs> long claws. And so I had this big, burly young man, and I opened up the door to the house just in time to hear him say, look at the cute little chicken. And he opened up the pan, and that jungle fowl went whack right into his face. It clawed all the way up his face, over the top of his head. He fell screaming back into the cage banks behind him as the jungle fowl took off. And nobody wanted to get to touch the big roosters because they thought they were the unfriendly jungle fowl. It was the little guy. And so that's, you know, naturally, chickens are nasty, and, and they will go after each other. So that is my number one issue right now with dealing with cage-free, is all these birds pecking. And so I have a rather large cage-free facility. The people want to, the owners, want to do something right. They went cage-free. They converted an old shallow pit barn, means the manure is right below you, um, into a cage-free facility. The birds only use a portion of the barn. They all want to be right crowded together. They've got this large barn and 50,000 of them right here. And they are pecking each other. They are breaking legs. They, now that they're pecking each other and tearing the skin, all that manure that's sitting on top, which you're walking on, is infecting these um, uh, wounds that they have in their skin. So we have gangrenous dermatitis. I have broken legs. I've got broken wings. I finally told them that my only solution for this was to burn down the barn and start over. I don't know what to say for this particular issue. On top of that, I have spirochetosis. And spirochetosis is something we haven't seen in quite a while in poultry. It's not common here in the U.S. And I have no medication to treat it with. Pigs, Denigard, you can. So that's not proof for use in poultry. So how would I stop that? And just most recently found out we also had salmonella. So that's a whole congregation of things that I have to look at. If they're laying eggs, we worry about egg eating. Because if the egg's on the floor, it's, it's new, it's unusual, it's not taken out of my cage now. And then somebody comes along and defecates on the egg. And then they're looking at that defecation, they start pecking at it, and they peck open an egg. It's like cribbing in horses. It's a bad habit, it's a pica. Well, they get so desirous of this egg, they go after somebody else's rear end to get that egg. And so as it's coming out, and they destroy another chicken by pecking at the rear end. So this is some of the things I've seen in Indiana. This is a, a backyard farm, as you can see. Very, very poverty-stricken. Right there is the tip of Canoe River. 
that was at low, Tippecanoe River. Three or four times a year, this floods. The man that owned this place, he packs his 50 chickens and his six kids into camper. They go up on the top of the hill and wait for the water to go down. And what was the issue here? The issue was these birds had salmonella. I'm looking at him, he says, these, are my, these 50 chickens are my children's future. And I am expected to try to help him with these 50 chickens. He has six children, one of which was about six years old and was tailing me around looking at the chickens, picking them up, handling them. Look at this. This is mud. That's the way this looks year-round is mud. And the little boy, I looked at him as we are getting ready to leave, and I said, honey, you've got to not handle the chickens and put your hands in your mouth. You need to wash your hands always after handling the chickens. So he digests this, and then he takes his hands, licks his hands, and dries them on his mother's apron. And I went, oh, my God. And salmonella amongst people, amongst the chickens, you name it. This is a backyard flock and what we want to, what our animal rights um, organizations want us to go to. So this is an Amish farmer. He's raising these Amish. About 90% of the ducks raised in Indiana were number one in ducks, is raised by Amish. But this particular individual is doing this as an individual rather than as a contract um, for a company. And this is a person who has a number of kids. Everybody's helping. He's doing the best he possibly can on raising these birds. Ducks do have to be raised either on slats or on litter. They're not going to be raised in cages. But take a look of how dirty these animals are. I see more dirty animals on the floor than I ever see in cages. Look at this litter. Litter is an issue. I don't know how many of you with other species, is litter, cost of litter, is that an issue for all of you? I'm assuming it's got to be. We don't have good shavings anymore because there isn't a construction industry. So all the shavings that we had that were in plentiful supply, we can't get. So what do we get? We get particle board, we've got nails, we've got uh, old railroad ties that have been uh, chewed up, which means they got crease sewed in them. So there's toxic materials. So what are people doing? They're going to straw. So what do we look at here with straw? We've got feces in here. The straw quality it doesn't absorb very well. It is not good. And we don't have anything better to put them on. And this is a real issue for us is because, again, legs, feet, um, we get uh, uh, burns on the foot if they're stepping in manure. So their paw scores are terrible. Um, three or four, we usually go from one to four for paw scores. So it's a real issue. It's another one of my backyard facilities. I guess it's kind of bright in here to see this. This is what was more there. They're on the floor. This guy's so filthy and has so few um, feathers, I could put him on PETA's website. And there, uh, in this particular case, what I was doing with here is uh, moldy corn. He was just chopping up whatever corn that was in the field. Vomitoxin is the toxin that we're seeing out in Indiana. Um, and this is a pretty damp state, so that's common. Here's another um, of this particular farm. Look at this. Feces. Um, it's a biosecurity nightmare. Mind you, these people are, this, this person was in the county that, uh, in Indiana that has the most poultry production. And he was less than a tenth of a mile from a commercial, a large commercial operation. So what do I advise my commercial facilities on how to raise clean birds when this is so close? And uh, just another example of what we see with mud. Um, this is just solid mud. Here's the chicken. Um, and this is an example of, uh, of the same place. You can see one of my students in biosecurity gear, which is kind of silly when there's <coughs> much other biosecurity there than our gear. Um, but in this case, the person said to me, Doc, I knew practice <coughs> could get my birds. So I went and I fenced them all in. You can see these ones right here all fenced in. They all had coccidia because they were eating each other's, well, I ate the chickens and the turkeys. And these were turkeys right here, chickens on the other side. Um, were eating the manure, and they got coccidia. She lost virtually all of her chickens. Um, so issues that we don't generally see. And just another example of the amount of manure. <coughs> I see the birds. There's birds down in here. Um, this is a, a pheasant. <coughs> pheasant farm. Pheasants out in the field. <coughs> Called me up because they thought they had Newcastle disease because they had neurologic signs. Well, I can show you right here and right here, two folds either a fox or a coyote. Um, we have quite a few of those. I always threaten my cats. I, I do cat rescue. I'm a foster for cat rescue, which always surprises 
the animal rights people because they're sure that if I'm a poultry veterinarian, I don't love animals. Um, and so I, I, I always threaten my cats that they're going to be put outside for coyote bait. Um, they don't listen to me, but uh, this is common. I used to watch in California with the California woodies. Those are those slats, wood slat houses that the slats would bend up. And you get some um, person moving into Petaluma, where these houses used to be, and they're not used for commercial so much anymore. And they get themselves about 50 turkeys, and they put them in that house. And the turkey would stick its head out, and up would run a coyote and bite the head off. Turkey falls back in there like this, and every other turkey goes, wow, and sticks its head out. <laughs> and I get a call going, oh my God, some Satanist came in and chopped all the heads off our turkeys. Well, I don't know if I count that as Satanist. Lice. This is one of my backyard birds. Died. Lice. I can't treat it because ivermectin isn't approved for use in poultry. And I tell you, powders won't touch that. <coughs> Northern foul mite. Another one that I see quite a bit of as well. Tapeworms. Everybody, I'm sorry, it's right after lunch, but tapeworms. So, clock termination, I'll stop right you know, pretty soon here. Birds being killed inhumanely. Um, we do have slaughter rules. We do um, try to have rules about how birds are transported. If you have broken legs, broken backs, broken knees, <coughs> you lose money on those birds. And you are going to fire the people who are catching those birds if you've got this. <coughs> it behooves us to take care of them. Disposal ruining the environment. This is a slide of Andy Miles. And uh, I like to use it um, compared to, this is Pfizer Animal House, of what we see in commercial poultry. Because I'll end with a kind of short story. When I was at Santa Fe uh, many years ago, I had a friend um, that worked there. And he had um, he had a small gentleman's farm, five acre farm. Next door he had a farmer who was uh, raising rabbits and show rabbits. And he had this stud rabbit that was worth a lot of money. And he always talked. Every time I came over, you know, veterinarian comes over, uh, the neighbor had to rush over and get my advice. And so every time I was over at my friend's place, well, we were over one night um, having a few beers, playing a game, having a great time. And my friend's dog came inside carrying this rabbit, dead or in a doornail. And my friend, I mean, that ended the party right there. He's in tears. He's not sure what he's going to do. We left, and he kept drinking. And so about 2 o'clock in the morning, he came up with a solution. He said, I can't bring the rabbit back to life, and, but if I can still maintain good relations with my neighbor if he doesn't know my dog killed this rabbit. So what he did is he shampooed it, he blew it dry, and he snuck over and put it back in the cage. <laughs> so about two weeks later, my friend says to me, I haven't heard a word from the neighbor. I want you to come over because he'll come out and talk to you. So the neighbor comes out, and the neighbor's going, you know, he's talking a little bit, and he says, you remember that stud rabbit? I had my friend just stiffens up. And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, it died. And my friend's going, oh, my God. And I kick him. You know, you don't want to make yourself look even more guilty. And he says, no, no, no. It died because it was old. He said, but you know, it's the strangest thing. I buried it in the backyard. He said, next morning I came out and it was clean and fluffy and it was back in its cage, but still dead. So I like to defy you to show me a commercial industry where that, you know, kind of happens. But backyard, it happens all the time. Neighbor's dog digs up the dead animal and drags it home. So he never did tell the poor guy that it was his dog that had dragged him and shampooed him. This, this poor man probably thought, you know, believed in reincarnation and haunting. Um, so conclusions mine are efficient and economic food production. It's necessary for us to be able to eat. I travel a lot in countries where, you know, the only people who talk about animal rights and food safety are people with full, with full bellies. It's a luxury of, you know, a developed world. And farmers and veterinarians, we have the knowledge to be able to coordinate these two sometimes opposing things. And good management ensures good welfare, not housing time. And I thank you. That's my end of this. Thanks a lot.